Welcome to An Herbal Primer by Green Fire Herbs. This is Lesson 1, What is an Herb? Everyone knows what an herb is, right? According to the dictionary, an herb is a plant whose stem does not produce woody, persistent tissue and generally dies back at the end of each growing season. In fact, the word herb comes from the word herbaceous, which means non-woody. The definition may also refer to herbs as weedy, flavorful, often aromatic plants used in cooking or herbal healing. The herbs that come to mind here are plants like chamomile, rosemary, or peppermint. Mention the word herb without a context, and most people would probably think of something along these lines. But it turns out that herbs can mean very different things to different people. Botany has a simple, specific definition. In botany, herbs are non-woody plants that are less than 30 centimeters tall. In cooking circles, herbs have a more restricted meaning. An herb is the green or leafy part of a plant used for flavoring, but that is not a main ingredient. It doesn't matter if an herb is aromatic or not, so parsley would be considered an herb while cucumber would not be. The line isn't clearly defined though. Basil is an herb, but is also the main ingredient in pesto. In the culinary world, herbs and spices are not the same thing. While herbs are the green, leafy parts of the plant, spices can be any other part. So dill weed is an herb, but dill seed is a spice. Cinnamon, cloves, ginger, allspice, lemon zest, and anise seed are all spices. Herbs are commonly used in gardening, often as borders. Many of these plants are edible and may be some of the same herbs we grow for cooking or medicine. Many of them are decorative only, but like most of the herbs we've talked about so far, these plants are non-woody plants. Herbs can also be used as natural dyes. Now we start getting away from the idea of an herb as a non-woody plant and start thinking of herbs as plants of any kind that are useful. Many natural plant dyes can be made from herbs like alkanite root, goldenrod, dandelion, and turmeric, but other dye herbs include walnut hulls and the bark of sassafras and oak trees. To an herbalist, an herb is any plant material that has healing properties. This includes botanical herbs, flowers, bark, roots, seeds, seed pods, berries, many plants we generally think of as weeds, as well as ferns, mosses, seaweed, lichen, fungi, and resins. Many of these herbs can be taken internally, while many others are for external use only. That's a pretty exhaustive list. It includes everything from our plant-based foods to some fairly poisonous plants that you would never use unless under the supervision of a highly skilled practitioner. Now, you may not consider something like rice to be an herb, but you can view rice as an herb that's on the most food-like, least medicinal end of the spectrum, and there are herbalists that do. The reason is that so many of our foods have medicinal value, even if only a little. Many common foods are both food-like and healing at the same time, sometimes becoming more medicinal when taken in larger doses. There are herbs we consider to be more medicinal that could easily be cooked into our food and incorporated into our diets. In fact, many herbs that are treated as medicinal in one culture are a common food in another. For the purposes of this primer, the herbs we'll be discussing will be somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. Herbs that are more healing and less food-like, yet still safe to use. Though herbs on the extreme food end of the spectrum, like rice, also have their uses in healing, and we will talk a bit more about that in a later lesson. For now, we're going to ignore the most food-like and most medicinal ends of the spectrum. We're including herbs that can be taken internally, as well as herbs that are used externally only. Today the word chemical has a bad rap. Chemicals are sometimes seen as dangerous, as things to be avoided. People will talk about going chemical free, for example, or discuss the dangers of certain chemicals used in a product. Certainly we use many man-made chemicals that are known to be dangerous, and we use many more that are suspect, and way too many that are untested. There are plenty of dangerous chemicals that occur naturally as well. But frankly, chemicals are a part of everything, including rocks, soil, animals, and plants. Living things are chemical factories. All living cells use chemistry to do the work that they do. The chemicals the plants produce are called phytochemicals. Herbs contain literally thousands of these chemicals. So far, we've identified hundreds of them. And we're still working on understanding many of the chemicals we've identified. These include vitamins, minerals, trace elements, and a number of compounds that fall into specific chemical classes. For example, phenols are aromatic and generally have antiseptic and antibacterial actions. The coumarins are generally antimicrobial and antifungal. 
Flavonoids tend to be orange, yellow, or red in color and are antioxidant. There are several of these groups, each with their own set of actions. I don't plan on covering herbal chemistry in this primer. If this is something you would like me to cover, let me know. I may if there's enough interest. Understanding how herbs work through understanding their chemical constituents can be helpful, but we need to remember that we've just begun this journey. It's tempting to reach conclusions based on the little we do know, without regard to how much more we still don't know. For example, we often think in terms of an herb's active ingredients. Once we identify one or two ingredients that we think are responsible for the herb's healing properties, we often extract these ingredients, standardize them, and sell them as supplements. We may incorporate them into new medicines, or we may decide an herb is dangerous on the basis of one or two of these chemical constituents. Supplements aren't necessarily a bad thing, but it's important to remember that herbs work synergistically. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. Many chemicals can change the way other chemicals work. A chemical may not need to be concentrated to do its job well. It may just need the presence of another chemical, maybe one we haven't yet identified. Likewise, the harmful effects of one chemical may be reversed by the effects of another. There is still too much about plant chemistry that we don't understand, and we tend to forget that. Many phytochemicals express themselves in the color, smell, taste, and feel of a plant. These are called the herb's energetics. Herbalism has a long history of associating these physical characteristics with their impact on our bodies. Our understanding and use of herbal energetics goes back 6,000 years, and we're still adding to the field today. I'll be covering energetics in a future lesson. Herbs can be taken in a number of different ways depending on their chemical constituents. We'll get more into this in the lesson on herbal preparations. But briefly, many herbs can be cooked into food or eaten raw, perhaps in a salad. Others can be ground into powder and taken by capsule. Many preparations require extracting the medicinal properties of the herb into some medium called the menstruum. The most commonly used menstruum is water. When you make an herbal tea, the water-soluble constituents are released into the water. Tinctures use alcohol or glycerin as the menstruum. Oil, honey, and vinegar are also commonly used. Be aware that the same herb can have different healing properties depending on the menstruum used. Some of its constituents may be released into water, while others may need a fat. Milk teas can be made from these herbs. The menstruum can also be carrier oils like olive oil or almond oil. Some chemicals are alcohol soluble, others are not. The same is true for glycerin and vinegar. Keep this in mind when buying or making tinctures since many herbs don't tincture well. Essential oils, also called aromatic or volatile oils, could easily have a primer of their own. We'll cover them briefly in a future lesson. In general, the more food-like an herb is, the safer it is to use internally. A lesson on the safety of herbs will be coming up next, but I want to touch on it now. There are many herbs that can be taken long term and in larger doses. Drinking the tea made from an ounce of nettle leaf a day every day would be fine. So would a daily salad of dandelion leaf. These herbs tend to work slowly over time. They're the more nourishing herbs. They're gentle and slow acting yet highly effective. They're often used for chronic conditions or for maintaining good health. Some of these food-like herbs called adaptogens have a peculiar property. They're generally not one of the best herbs to use for anything that they do, though there are exceptions. But they're pretty good for so many things, have such broad action, that people in just about every part of the world but the U.S. use them daily, every day of their lives. This will be discussed in more detail when we start talking about herb actions in the lesson on adaptogens. And yes, I did say an ounce of nettle. A tea bag or teaspoon of dried herb per cup may make a nice beverage, but that's about all. Some herbs are taken in small doses, but the most commonly used herbs, the supportive, food-like, nourishing herbs, are generally taken in larger doses. A half ounce to two ounce of dry weight of herb a day is common. A person's health and the reason for taking the herb are considered when determining dosage. We'll cover more on this in a future lesson. As you move further toward the medicinal end of the spectrum, you start to encounter herbs that should be taken for shorter periods, in smaller doses, or both. The more medicinal an herb is, the more dosage and length of use become important. These herbs start to be recommended for more specific acute conditions. They help to resolve the immediate problem, for example, killing the infection, relieving the headache, or reducing blood pressure. But relieving the symptoms is just the beginning. 
What you really want to do is strengthen the immune system, prevent the headache, understand the reason for the increase in blood pressure, and take steps to keep it at a normal level. And where possible, you want to use the gentler, nourishing herbs to do it. Okay, but why? What's wrong with keeping that bottle of tincture ready for the next time that headache starts? Well, that headache may be a symptom of another problem, one that could be doing more damage than just giving you a headache. Forcing the reduction of a symptom doesn't treat the root cause. If you're not well, you'll remain not well. If your body is out of balance, it's prone to additional problems. So you want to alleviate painful, uncomfortable, or dangerous symptoms, but the next step should always be to help the body heal to bring the body back into balance. And finally, help you remain well, remain balanced. Keep in mind I'm speaking very generally here. No doubt you're thinking of situations where you would want to treat only the symptoms. For something like sunburn, most insect bites, or a sprain, you would only need to treat the symptoms. Even a headache can be just a headache. Or it can mean you need to improve your circulation to get more blood to your brain, or you may need to help your body deal with stress better. We'll talk more about dealing with specific problems in later lessons. Keep in mind, stronger herbs are more likely to have side effects. Also, the closer you get to the medicinal end of the spectrum, the more likely you'll encounter herbs that are toxic. These herbs can be lifesavers in the hands of master herbalists, but deadly when not used very, very carefully. The primary goal of herbalism is to get the body to a state of health when necessary, then to maintain that state of health. We'll start talking about herbalism in Lesson 3. There are other aspects of herbal safety to consider. I'm going to cover them briefly here and go over them in more detail in the next lesson. I don't know of a single food that I can safely say no one is allergic to. The same is true for herbs. Everyone is different. Not everyone responds to any given herb, or for that matter, any given conventional medication in the same way. An herb may work wonders for you, but do nothing for your friend. Two people can use the same herb for the same thing and get the same results, but need two different doses. For some people, an herb can make things worse. Valerian is a good example of how different people can respond differently to the same herb. For some people, in lower doses, it seems to nourish the nervous system. For others, it doesn't. In moderate doses, it can have a calming effect on many people, but not on everyone. At higher doses, it can put many people to sleep, but again, it doesn't work for everybody. Some people can use valerian in all three ways. Some people only see a benefit in two out of the three, and some for only one. Then there are some people who can't use it at all. It acts as a stimulant, making them hyper and jittery. Then there are those on whom valerian has no impact. The first time you use an herb, be cautious. Use only a little and see how it makes you feel. If you don't like what it does, stop using it. If you continue, make sure you use the right dose. If you're taking one of the more food-like herbs, understand that it can take some time before you see any results. If you're taking one of the stronger herbs, you should know what to expect and when you should start to see some results. If that herb isn't helping you, try something else. If you take any medications, always be aware of any interactions that may occur between the herbs you want to take and your meds. My goal in this lesson was to introduce you to herbs as they are viewed and used in herbal healing. Hopefully you have a better understanding of herbs, of how we use them, of how complex they are, and some idea of how they work. This is a huge topic, and just about everything we discussed will be covered in greater depth in later lessons. This lesson was to give you a framework, a context for understanding future lessons. Over the next few lessons, we'll be covering herbalism, the world's major herbal systems, herbal safety, and herbal energetics. These will be followed by lessons on herbal actions, what herbs actually do. So please, join us next week for lesson two, are herbs safe?